On this edition of SciTech Now, find out how a Cornell team of scientists could help usher in ultra-thin electronics with a transistor just three atoms thick. The transistor is the, one of the most important devices that allows us to use and enjoy electronics. Then we see how new technology could take the food you throw away and put it back on the grocery store shelves. What's behind the planet's next mass extinction? And see what happens when regular folks grab a microphone and tell stories about science. Coming up next on SciTech Now. SciTech Now is made possible through the support of our members. Mohawk Valley Community College. Your future starts here. Offering education and workforce development ranging from hands-on to high-tech, including nano, manufacturing, electrical engineering, and more. More information at mvcc.edu. And by Giotto Enterprises, whose companies include Fiber Instrument Sales, The Light Connection, Molding Solutions, and Firmer Precision. Providing solutions for fiber optic, telecom, molding, and CNC machining industries. More information at giottoenterprises.com. Hello, I'm Simon Perez, and welcome to SciTech Now, our weekly program bringing you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology, and innovation here in central New York and across the country. And we begin with a promising breakthrough in transistor technology at Cornell University. A research team there has developed the world's thinnest transistor, just three atoms thick, or should we say thin. Here's a look at the lab that could be the birthplace of ultra-thin electronics. The transistor is the, one of the most important devices that allows us to use and enjoy electronics. It turns on and off depending on the you know, switching mode that we are using. You can do a lot of uh, functions. What we have realized uh, in our work is that uh, finally we have succeeded in making large-scale, uniform, semiconductor film. And that's something that we have done with this Three atom thing material. It's called uh, it's a bulky wall transition metal dichalcosin. I just call TMD, but it is just semiconductor that is made into a three atom thick film. What it did was we just uh, controlled our cooking process, let's say, or chemical synthesis process to a much much uh, carefully controlled level. So that allowed us to get high quality film. To make this film, uh, you need you know, two kinds of components. You need you know, transition metal and you need charcoal atoms. So these are the two components that we want to introduce into our growth chamber. We use this new process where we introduce our transition metal atoms or our components atom by atom that's embedded inside of a molecule. So what molecules do is that they like to fly out and then form gas phase. And as a result, we can have the precise amount of material inside of our growth chamber. So that change of uh, making our precursors introduced at the right uh, you know, concentration, that was the key to our success. And once we figured out how to do it, then it was all the optimization process. It's only a few atoms thick. So for instance, how do we see it? That is actually a big challenge. And second, still, in, at, especially at the beginning, the quality was not very good. So it looks nice, but it doesn't you know, carry electricity very well. Then what is the problem? It turns out that there were all kind of broken pieces at the tiniest you know, microscopic level, which we cannot see with our bare eyes. What that means is even under optical microscope, you cannot see it. So we had to look at it under electron microscope and understand what was going on, and then tweak the process so that instead of uh, it becomes, instead of broken pieces, it becomes continuous film. This film that we are making is the ultimate limit in terms of the you know, thickness of semiconductors and electronic material. Here is a bunch of uh, photo masks that is a, it's like the specific a coarse plate that we fabricated for making devices down to micrometer scale, which is really small. And today we're going to take this um, photo mask and the wafer and make some real devices. Here is the uh, spinner where we 
kind of rotate the wafer really fast and then leave a layer of polymer there, which is called photoresist. And using this, we can further do the fabrication, the devices out of it. It is really uh, versatile in terms of you know, its future use. It's highly bendable, for instance. For instance, you know, let's say you, take, you make all your devices, you cannot bend it or you cannot fold it into small scale. But what this material does is that it, since it's highly bendable and flexible, then it can be realized into a completely different form. We need to be ready to be able to uh, succeed in something. Uh, I sometimes look at what we have achieved in terms of research, but there were a lot of failures and also small successes that prepared us to successfully make uh, these structures and material. So that is very important. You know, all the failures and all the hard work that uh, my group have uh, uh, had through, uh, group, you know, have gone through, uh, that really helped us to uh, develop this. And another thing is that we need to constantly think about new ways to use this and then new ways to utilize what we already have. And electronics or all the information technology doesn't need to be the way that uh, we are using it now. You know, what is the new way to realize this and then how we can get there? Those things are something that we are constantly thinking about. And I think you know, we learned that we can make a meaningful contribution toward that goal. Parks Group wants to make sure the material can be produced consistently before introducing it to the open market. The USDA estimates supermarkets lose $15 billion each year in unsold fruits and vegetables because they wilt or rot before they can be sold. Often what's left just goes into the landfill. But a company in Washington State has developed a new technology to turn the money loser into a money maker. Walk into just about any supermarket and you'll see a beautiful bounty of fresh food. But behind the eye-catching displays, is a far less appetizing truth. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, every year more than 21 million tons of food sold in retail stores never makes it to consumers. One in seven truckloads of perishables delivered to grocery stores will be thrown out. Most of the losses happen in the produce aisle. We have over 350 fruits and vegetables. There's a lot of food that will go past sell date or be unsellable for one reason or another. To meet consumer demands, grocers tend to stock only the most attractive produce. Anything less than perfect gets pitched. Most grocery stores have no choice but to put their food scraps in with the trash. But at PCC Natural Market in Issaquah, Washington, food scraps don't go in the trash. And they don't get composted either they're put in a machine called a harvester. Our food scraps go immediately into the harvester where they're processed. There is no odor. Inside, everything is blended into a liquid and stored in a sealed tank. The harvester is the brainchild of a team of former Microsoft executives. They wondered if they could use data to attack the problem of commercial food waste. Larry Lesseur is the CEO. As we looked at this food waste issue and we started asking the questions of why it was occurring, no one had the answers. There was no data. There was no metrics on it. So we looked at this and said, if we could capture the metrics, if we could understand the data behind it, we could alter behavior. Every pile of food that goes into a harvester is weighed and coded by what department it came from. That real-time data is sent to grocers so that they can see exactly where they're losing food. But how do they get rid of that silo of blended food scraps? We put all this energy and effort into growing this food source, and then we're trying to figure out how do we make it all go away conveniently. We're not benefiting from all this hard effort that we got from our society in growing the food in the first place. If you view the food scraps as a waste, you've missed the point. Food scraps are a resource. Victor Tyrone is Weiserg's chief science officer. And the aroma. He wondered if that slurry of food waste could be turned into an organic fertilizer. The potential is massive. You're talking about the need for millions of gallons of organic fertilizer. We might expect a harvester to produce maybe 10,000 gallons of fertilizer over a period of time, 
but the need is for millions of gallons of fertilizer. They started analyzing the liquid in the lab and figured out that they could indeed turn what was once meant to be food for people into food for plants. But would this organic fertilizer be effective in large-scale crop production? Ted Andrews is one of the owners of Herbco. It's an organic culinary herb farm that started in Duval, Washington, and now has farms in eight states. We put fresh herbs in little packages and sell them to grocery stores. Organic farming can be more challenging, but Andrews says it's worth it. As a steward of the land, I prefer to have organic inputs rather than conventional inputs that could run off into the Snoqualmie River, which is right over there. When a Weizerg representative told Andrews about a fertilizer made from food scraps, it sounded too good to be true. I have a lot of people trying to sell me products of all kinds and always have a healthy skepticism, but uh, I dared him to prove it to me. They set aside a field of basil as a test plot and started using Weizerg fertilizer in their drip irrigation system. A few months later, the difference was measurable. The Weizerg basil had 30% more biomass. The leaves were bigger, and the color was deeper than basil in other fields. It turns out it actually is quite a bit more effective than what we're used to. Andrew says he hopes to use the Weizerg fertilizer on more of his fields next year. Then he'll have even more herbs to package up and send to supermarkets. And farmers aren't the only ones who can buy this food waste fertilizer. It's also being sold on supermarket shelves, including the PCC where the food scraps came from in the first place. Not only are we making a difference with the food waste and preventing it from happening, we're doing it in a sustainable way and we're doing it in an environmentally friendly way that makes economic sense for the business. For the Weiserg team, this idea of closing the food waste circle could be a model for supermarkets across the country. Last year, Central New Yorkers tossed more than 39 million pounds of food scraps into the trash. If you'd like to save a little landfill space, head to a local composting site. The Onondaga County Resource Recovery Agency has locations in Camillus and Jamesville, and they're open until the end of November. Some scientists argue our planet is currently in the midst of a mass extinction of plants and animals, meaning that nearly half of all species could disappear in the next few decades. There are many factors at play, including climate change, pollution, and overharvesting. SciTech Now's Hari Srinivasan discusses this trend with a sustainability expert who says this isn't the first time. Mass extinction sounds incredibly scary, and I'm thinking it is. It is. It's happened before, so I think when something's happened before, people tend to think, well, maybe it won't be so bad. We've gotten through five of them after all, right? Right. So won't we get through the sixth one? There's some truth to that. The problem is we're actually in the middle of this one, and we're also the cause of it. And we're, humans weren't around for all five of the previous ones, no. and certainly not seven billion or eight billion of us, right? Right, and I think that that's uh, part of the problem is that maybe if there were fewer numbers of uh, uh, people living on the, the planet, the environmental consequences of losing all this biological diversity wouldn't be so bad. But we're looking at seven and a half, maybe up to nine billion people in the next 50 years who could really suffer a lot of uh, consequences from losing biodiversity. Okay, so what are the billions of people that are on the planet doing today to hurry this mass extinction along? So um, I think that much of what's happening is really something that isn't connected to, to biodiversity loss. There's a lot of effort to conserve species, a lot of effort to try to protect endangered habitats. And I think the focus tends to come from our idea that there's sort of a cultural or emotional attachment that we have to, to species. But what that creates is a sense is that if we have protected areas and parks um, or, or, uh, or national forests, that'll do the trick um, because we can save all the species. Almost as if you felt you put them in, a, in an ark and that's mm. all you have to do. But then we forget that biodiversity actually consists of all the species that are parts that make our ecosystems work. So things like potable water, breathable air, the cycling of nutrients, the stable production of food, both on terrestrial and marine systems, all of that depends on all of these parts working together. So if there are 8.7 million parts that are making our Earth work and we're about to lose half of them, that's of concern. 
Okay, and you know, in biology class in middle school or something, you learn about the food chain and how when you take something out of the food chain, it could have ripple effects. But beyond this one singular chain, there's what you're describing is kind of a multivariate system with all of these millions of parts are existing and, you know, one goes down here and another goes down here. There are these different consequences that we haven't thought of. Yeah, so when I teach this, uh, one of the things I like to do if I can is to find an old computer and bring it into the class, pop the top off of it, and then I ask the student, uh, students when I reach in with a pair of pliers to remove a part, what's going to happen? In? And many of them immediately think that the computer is going to, to, to crash or maybe sparks will fly out like a science fiction movie. That doesn't usually happen. In fact, you can pull out a few parts and the computer seems to still be working. In that case, I think they have a sense that in the computer you have many, many parts that are all connected to one another and they produce complex um, processes that we, that we really depend on from our computer. The funny thing is if you try to then sell them the computer, even though it's working and you've removed just a few parts, they won't buy it. They're convinced that it's not really a good computer anymore. But if I told them that the biosphere, which is this you know, 3.5 billion year old, trillion ton solar powered machine, is losing half its parts, it doesn't seem to worry them as much as if you lost some parts from your computer. Well, besides those students, there are still people who are out there that say, you know, it's not human action. What evidence do we have that it's what we're doing that's actually causing this extinction versus different natural cycles? That's a, a difficult one to, to tackle. Not so much that, that humans aren't at fault, but quantifying um, what's happening. So the big problem is that we estimate there's about 8.7 million species, but that's an estimate. And in fact, we probably only know um, about two or three percent of all the species that are out there. So then if we turn around and say, well, we're losing all these species, just after we said we don't actually know what's out there, then people say, what? You know, how, can you, how can you say those two things at one time? But we actually have very good ways of quantifying roughly how many species are, that are there. The same way astronomers can quantify how many stars are in the universe or how many planets are habitable in, in our galaxy or other galaxies. We have these very same methods. Um, but people would prefer to have something more accurate than that. How do you take the research that you're doing and uh, turn that into a policy prescription or a suggestion for whether it's a government or a corporation that's working in different parts of the world that might have ecological concerns or consequences? Well, there are lots of different ways of doing that. You can start right at home, encouraging people to, say, diversify the number of species they have in their garden or maybe have a garden rather than a lawn. You can encourage people to consider buying food from an organic farm, which is usually much more diverse than an industrial farm. Um, but then you can scale up and you can ask whether or not the city could invest more in, say, like in New York City, the million uh, 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 tree planting campaign. Um, and then you can scale it up to the global level. We have the, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, which is hoping to achieve 20 different targets to conserve biodiversity by the year 2020. Um, so it's 20 by 2020. There's a lot of numerical alliteration there. So I think at almost every level, from, from your home to your city to your nation to, to the world, what's interesting that the, is that the Convention on Biological Diversity, every nation except the, United nation, except the United States, Andorra and the Vatican, has signed that. That kind of global agreement that we really should preserve biodiversity shows that our research has actually had an impact and, and the world is listening. All right, Shahid Naeem from the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Thanks so much. Thank you. Larger animals seem particularly vulnerable to extinction because they reproduce less frequently, require more space to live, and are more attractive to hunters because they carry more meat. Up next, we take you to a place where science is a story well told. Across the country, people from all walks of life are taking to the stage to tell their stories of how science has made a difference in their lives. SciTech Now contributor Andrea Vasquez shows us the goal is not to learn, but to entertain. Please welcome to the stage, Bradford Jordan. Third grade show and tell is a high stakes game. Especially in Mr. Denholm's class at Castleview Elementary School in Riverside, California. Somewhere, rational or not, I had this vague, dark vision of the city just coming unraveled. So I'm a medical actor. I am someone that acts out a character that has an ailment for medical students. But a few months ago, I show up to work thinking that that day I was going to have an STD. And I get there and my supervisor hands me the schedule and he says there's been a change and that today I'm going to give birth. 
and I'm gonna give birth three times. They're all sharing stories about science. Ben Lilly is a former particle physicist who turned to the stage for a way to combine science and storytelling. What's missing is talking about science in how it affects people and how it intersects with people's lives. That's what I'd been, been flailing around trying to find. I tried to do a stand-up set, I tried to do a solo show, those were both terrible. We wanted science in people's lives, stories, just put them together and do it. Lily met another physicist turned storyteller and the two founded The Story Collider, a podcast of true personal stories about science told live on stage. Senior producer Aaron Barker was skeptical at first. I thought it was a dumb idea. I thought it's going to be so boring. No one's going to want to come to that. <laughs> but I went to the first show for the first time. It was really amazing. And it turns out science stories are not stories about, you know, that class in high school that you skip. Adam Becker is a freelance astrophysicist and veteran story collider performer who sees it as a way to talk to people about science without a lecture. I like telling stories. I like talking about science to people. You know, normally I think of, okay, I'm gonna go talk to a kindergarten class now, or I'm gonna go, you know, help out a museum now. I hadn't really thought of, oh, let me connect with people on an emotional level about science. An imposter syndrome is, is when you think that everybody else belongs where you are because they're clearly talented and intelligent and you don't. And what made it worse, strangely, was that I had this incredibly excellent PhD advisor named Dragan Hutterer. There are stories about love and courage and goals and ambitions, and I think that's what surprised me the most. Today I had worked with him. We were equal. He came to me for help. I told him what to do, and it was a good idea. I sounded smart. I sounded informed. I sounded like I belonged, and I felt good. Storytellers, like the audience, are a mix of scientists and non-scientists. We have senior scientists, we have grad students, we have postdocs, but then we also have people who've had no formal contact with science since like middle school uh, science class. The idea of giving fake birth is causing me so much more panic and anxiety than the idea of giving real birth or having a baby at all, and I'm just staring at my supervisor and I'm like, I have no other choice but to quit this job right now. Part of what we really want is to show that science really does affect everyone. Um, and so we try to get as broad a spectrum as we can. What's the first rule of Story Collider? That's right, there right. is no learning at Story Collider. The science here is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> but audiences do learn. The Story Collider's producers work with performers to give their stories a narrative arc and simplify the hard science. We find that if there's just one piece of jargon or just one piece of complicated science in a story that the audience really takes it in and they will actually remember it for a really long time. But if it gets too bogged down, then it becomes too complicated. And that orbiting where two storms rotate around each other when they get close is called the Fujiwara effect. And I knew that I had never seen this before, not even in a scientific paper and definitely not when I was sitting on the ground in the place where the weather was going to happen. Story Collider is not alone in its pursuit to make science digestible for a wider audience. Blogs, YouTube channels, and other podcasts are jogging memories of high school science class for a growing number of people. But Story Collider's creators think there's something special about this medium that connects personal experience and science. You really need to, to get it a sense of intimacy between the storyteller and the audience. And doing it live really helps. And then audio podcasts are great for that. Um, you know, you're, you're sitting there mostly with headphones, just listening to this one other person's voice, and it really helps people get into, uh, into the stories. I think the more that people remember that science is a human enterprise, it's a thing that people do, and those people, you know, are their neighbors and their friends, the better, you know, put a human face on it. So I went home and I said, Dad, I need your help. I need to win show and tell. Then my dad, Hero, reaches into this uh, Tupperware and like, like Arthur pulling his sword from the stone, he lifts up in front of everyone in the class. Yes, it's true, it's real. A human brain! Take that, Hikaru Yamamoto! And that's it for this edition of SciTech Now. For more information on science, technology, and innovation, visit our website at wcny.org slash SciTechNow. 
and you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. Next week on SciTech Now, we talk to a Syracuse entrepreneur who's built his business on people sharing their lives through social media. Then find out what quantum computing is and what it can do. See how a New York company is playing a role in peering deep into outer space. And we'll take you to a museum whose motto isn't don't touch, but is please touch. Plus, find out how some of the best video you see on TV gets shot. I'm Simon Perez. We'll see you next week on SciTech Now. SciTech Now is made possible through the support of our members. Mohawk Valley Community College. Your future starts here. Offering education and workforce development ranging from hands-on to high-tech, including nano, manufacturing, electrical engineering, and more. More information at mvcc.edu. And by Giotto Enterprises, whose companies include Fiber Instrument Sales, The Light Connection, Molding Solutions, and Firmer Precision, providing solutions for fiber optic, telecom, molding, and CNC machining industries. More information at giottoenterprises.com.